folks uh, here as well. All right, so today we're going to talk about solutions journalism. We're going to move into our last section uh, in this class. And for those of you online who haven't heard about solutions journalism, it's kind of an emerging form of journalism meant to combat uh, news fatigue, a lot of bad news uh, that's out there. So we're going to talk about what it is and kind of ways to do it, ways to recognize it and uh, that kind of thing. So, all right, first of all, let's get into why we have it. Why bother with solutions journalism, right? So first of all, we have problems in this world, quite a few. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few examples in particular. So first, you know, there's an opioid epidemic still raging through the country. Uh, and that is very, uh, you, we get all these kind of numbers, this, uh, kind of tragic figures, things like that. 116 people die every day from opioid-related opioid drug overdoses, staggering figures. We get things like climate change, which we were just talking about before class started, right? We're getting hurricanes in mid-November. Uh, we're, we're seeing global warming at an alarming rate, scientists screaming for us to wake up. Uh, and to pay attention and to reverse uh, policies that make things worse. Um, and we get uh, uh, mass shootings. We're having uh, in this country, the mass shootings just keep going up and up and up in this country. And there's a lot to be depressed about. There's a lot to be scared about. I'm just gonna minimize this here real quick. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot to be scared about. There's a lot of things uh, that make following and reading the news very, very difficult for us, right? So. Traditional journalism coverage of those issues looks something like this, right? You know, we see these headlines, 59 die in Las Vegas attack. Uh, we see, you know, uh, magazine covers, be worried, be very worried. That's an unsettling headline. And, you know, we see those breaking news alerts, kind of those, those swoops, opioid crisis, that kind of thing. And these things, they have a really daunting effect on our mental health. Right. As a society, we're in, I would say, the midst of a mental health crisis. The pandemic was no help at all. And it gets hard uh, to keep getting this kind of doom and gloom news all the time presented in the same way. And that's not to say that these stories aren't important. They're very important. We need to know what's going on. But there are ways to approach these stories that can help us to understand them in a way that's healthier and help us to start to make some changes in the positive direction with these issues. So that's what we're going to talk about today with solutions journalism. So traditional journalism coverage, like I said, focuses disproportionately on the problem, on what's wrong with society. We're constantly talking about the issue and all the people that are to blame for it, right? Uh, it creates, like I said, news fatigue. Audiences, they feel helpless. They feel apathetic. Well, what can I do, right? Global warming is happening. What can I possibly do as one person? Um, you know, opioid crisis. What am I supposed to do? You know, I know a lot of you guys have done the, the Narcon training and things like that. You want to help. You feel like you, you should be able to, but it's hard. It's such an overwhelming thing. Mass shootings. What, as an individual, can you really do? Uh, and so those things tend to take their toll on us. And we start to eventually, and you guys saw when we did our voter education uh, drive or our voter uh, encouragement drive, people just being like, you know, what difference can I make? What difference does my one vote make? It gets exhausting. And so it stirs up some misguided anger. We're seeing uh, a lot in the political sphere of anger and fear. Those tend to be really motivating factors for people to uh, lay blame on certain people or to uh, kind of revolt against systems that would encourage help or inspire change. Uh, and so we see a lot of that based on this kind of negative, overwhelming tone of the news. It creates a panic, like I said, fear, uh, and it damages communities and their residents. I can tell you here in Salisbury that uh, there has been traditionally a perception that Salisbury is far more dangerous than it actually is. And if you watch, and this is actually a pretty common syndrome. It's called um, cultivation theory. And it's basically based on people who watch television news, you know, your local news reports, WBOC, WMDT, um, the ones in, in all over uh, your local broadcast. What are the first three or four news stories typically about on your local broadcast? Crime. Crime, almost always, right? And so if you are watching that every single day, are you going to be likely to think that you live in a pretty safe area? Definitely not, right? You're gonna be, you're gonna think, oh my God, I'm gonna die here. 
Okay. And so that, that fatigue, that's it's cultivation theory. We're hand picking the worst case examples and we're amplifying them. Uh, and that does have a negative effect on communities. And it did actually have a very negative effect. Uh, people were moving away from Salisbury in mass about 10, 12 years ago uh, because we, we seemed disproportionately uh, ridden with crime when in fact violent crime in this, in this city has gone way, way down in recent years. So these, these things can have a negative effect more than we realize. So that's where solutions journalism comes in. Basically with solutions journalism, and I'm gonna kind of share some slides with you. This is, these are all from the Solutions Journalism News Network. There's an entire nonprofit think tank devoted to this kind of new emerging form of journalism that I think you guys are really gonna like. Um, because you guys tend, this is the feature class. We like to focus on things that, well, they may be serious. We like to look at them with a tone that's a little bit more interesting, more gives us a little sense of uh, creativity. This isn't a breaking news class, right? Uh, and so solutions journalism is rigorous reporting on responses to social problems. Um, and I'm gonna kind of take you through the steps here quickly, and then I'm gonna kind of pull out each one, one by one as we go through. So features journalism, or I'm sorry, solutions journalism focuses on a response to a problem. So yes, it's gonna talk about the problem, obviously. We can't have a story about a response without saying, hey, there's a problem. But the problem part is gonna be really minimal. It's gonna say, yes, okay, there's a problem, but this story, your nut graph, right, is gonna be, here's what somebody or some group is doing to fix this problem, okay? So it's gonna provide evidence of results and we need that evidence because we need to show that this type of thing is actually working. It's not just some pie in the sky, oh, this wouldn't the world be great if we all just stopped driving gas cars. You know, that's, that's not realistic. We need evidence to show that our solution is working or that this solution is working. Uh, we're gonna detail a response for replication. So typically these solutions tend to be on a smaller scale. Because think about the opioid crisis, think about climate change, think about mass shootings. Is one person gonna solve all those things? No, probably not, right? Is one group even gonna solve those things? Probably not, okay? If Congress can't do it, I don't know how anybody else could, right? And so what we need to look at is kind of take these smaller solutions and add them up to bigger uh, fixes. So what are people doing at a smaller level and how can we take that solution and make it applicable in other places, right? So say we're doing something in Salisbury to lower crime. Uh, what are we doing that's working? And could other towns like us use that same kind of strategy? So that's what these stories really kind of look at. We also, because we're journalists, this isn't promotional uh, content, we have to include limitations. Every solution has limitations, right? Uh, for instance, if we were doing a recycling drive here in Salisbury, would we be able to encourage recycling all over the world? No, not necessarily, right? We're limited in what we can do. Sometimes, often, cost is a limitation. A lot of solutions cost money, and money is not always frequently available or, or widely available. Time is always a problem. Uh, outreach is always a problem. And so it wouldn't be a journalism story if we didn't include the limitations to the solution. We're not trying to advocate for a solution. We're not trying to say, uh, promote a group or a person. What we're trying to do is say, you know, here's someone who's had some success or some group that's had some success and here's how far you could get with it potentially. So what happens is we turn stories like this into ones like this. So we have, you know, the mass shooting, and then we have an article like this from New York Magazine that basically says how Australia and Britain tackle gun violence, right? So these are countries who have gotten their gun violence numbers down significantly in recent decades, and they have specific strategies that they've implemented. So this story explores those strategies instead of just talking about, well, another dozen people got shot today, right? This one actually looks at what people have done about it, what's working and what, what is not or how we could apply it elsewhere. Then we've got climate change. Uh, again, climate change is a huge worldwide issue that nobody's gonna tackle alone. Um, so we can ship away at it. And we can talk about people and groups that are trying to make a difference. So heat is deadly even in Montana, but the city of Missoula is doing something about it. 
All right, so here we have again a small group trying to make a difference. And the more small groups that try to make a difference, the more we can talk about these types of things, the closer we can get to a problem. Because what happens when we see stories like this is we go, we're all gonna die, right? And that's not really productive, but we see stories like this and we go, oh, maybe I can do something. Maybe I can help. Even if it's a little help, maybe I can do something. And so these types of stories can empower people where before they might've felt helpless or out of control. With the opioid crisis, you know, here's another example, local recovery group tackling the opioid crisis. Instead of opioid crisis, breaking news, everyone's dying, right? Instead, let's look at the people who are actually rolling up their sleeves, digging in and trying to solve the problem. So that's what this type of journalism is. So I wanna talk a little bit about what solutions journalism is not. Uh, just real quick, I'm gonna check in. Rebecca, are we okay? Am I on camera okay? Or am I wandering out of screen a lot? No, I think you're okay. I mean, your okay. voice is coming through. You're good. Okay, perfect, perfect. Just wanted to check in with our online folks. All right, so first of all, solutions journalism is not hero worship, okay? Whenever you, you see a newscast or something that says, you know, look at this local hero, that's not what we're talking about here, okay? It's not our job as journalists to, to sing anyone's praises, to tout any heroes in the community, right? There is a place for that. We can do some of that type of journalism, but that's not what this is. It's also not a silver bullet. Do you guys know what I mean by silver bullet? What does that mean? Anyone know? I think it's an older expression. So a silver bullet is a quick fix to a problem. It's like, okay, I'm gonna fire this silver bullet and the werewolf's dead, right? Done, done and done. The silver bullet is gonna be something that is gonna be uh, a quick, quick and painless, you know, okay, done with that. That's not what we're talking about here. There are no quick fixes. It's not free publicity. A lot of these will be born out of something like a press release, uh, for example, but it's not our job to publicize what people are doing well. It's our job to investigate it. So if someone sends us a press release and says, uh, yeah, we're doing this thing, we've got this solution to this problem, they need to understand when we report the story that we're gonna be looking for evidence of your solution. And we're gonna be looking and talking about some of the limitations to that solution. So we're not writing glorified ads here. That's not what we're doing. It's also not good intentions. Again, remember that focus on evidence. It's not like, oh, well, they mean well, or what a sweet idea. You know, kids are, are selling lemonade on the streets to um, raise money for their local animal shelter. Okay, that's sweet, but is it really making that big of an impact? You know, and again, there's room in journalism for those type of feel good stories, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about actual real investigative pieces. It's not activism. This is not journalists stepping in and saying, you know what, we're going to be the problem solvers. This is us focusing on problem solvers, but not necessarily being the problem solvers or advocates ourselves. And it's also not an afterthought. So, say, Someone solves a problem and then we're like, oh, right, that's a uh, solutions journalism, right? So what we're talking about here is something that in effect that's happening, that's going to continue to happen. It's a process. Solutions journalism is a process and not, again, a one and done kind of thing. Okay. Everybody good here? So again, journalism is not fluff or puff, puff pieces. And this is the Solution Journalism Network Network's favorite uh, video that I'm gonna share with you uh, to show an adorable feature story that is not solutions journalism. It's cute, it's fun, but it's not solutions journalism. So let me get this pulled up for us. And I'm gonna make sure I'm sharing my audio too. So give me just one second. Okay. Let's meet Chris P. Bacon, the pig. It seems so wrong. <laughs> yeah, I was doing this to me yesterday too. Here we go. The wheelchairs have been around for a long time and they're very successful for a lot of animals with similar abnormalities. <laughs> First time I put him to this cart, he didn't take to it very well. He was very loud. Just gotta get used to it. 
After about two or three minutes, though, he kind of calmed down and was more interested in everything that was around him versus what was attached to him. We all want pet pigs now, right? <laughs> So this is the uh, original wheelchair. This is the one that I built with my son's toys. This was the uh, neck piece that went around his neck. This went around his belly. This was the, the length of him, and his and his bottom sat down right here. And this is how big it was. And I would say he's grown a little bit since then. When he's in his wheels, he acts like a normal pig. He roots, he moves around, he goes where he wants to go, and he can do it pretty quickly. Here you go, buddy, here you go. Good job. They just have a functional goal in mind. They want to go do whatever they do. Wheelchair for a pig. That allows us to integrate prosthetics in an adaptive sense. It's not going to look normal, but it's going to allow the normal motion to occur. Being a veterinarian and seeing dogs in chairs all the time and how well that it really just lights them up, allows them to become mobile again. Here, got a little something for you. I knew that there was something that we could do for the pig. Come on, Chris. Treat. So the commitment that I have with crispy bacon is going to be lifelong. <laughs> we have those. For a pig, you know, we're looking into the teens. <laughs> but uh, it's a commitment that I'm willing to make. There you go. He's just, it, it's a beautiful story. He's a beautiful pig and he has a huge message. All right. Let me go ahead and get rid of this here. So it's adorable, right? It's a cute story. We all want pet pigs now, <laughs> but you know, it's cute and entertaining. But really, that solutions journalism is going to focus on real and persistent problems. So yes, what was proposed there was a solution to a problem, right? But we have to think, is there actually a large scale need for pig wheelchairs? It's not really solving a big problem, right? It's not something that affects a whole lot of people. In fact, it's probably a news story based on what news value? Novelty, Novelty oddity, right? This thing doesn't happen a lot. Uh, and so that's why this is kind of cute. It's fun, but it's not the kind of journalism that we're talking about here. We're not talking about um, just one person solving one small problem. We're talking about something that's more applicable to a wider audience. So solutions journalism is anyone uh, is basically solutions journalism is part of a higher quality news product. And it's a universe of stories that aren't being told. So uh, those of you guys who are in my critical issues class as well, know we just did a project on underrepresented stories uh, and why they need to be told. And these stories tend to go that way too. Again, not because they're not important, but because we're so focused as journalists on the problem that a lot of times the solutions or the smaller solutions makers get swept under the rug. Those stories aren't as compelling to us because they're not shocking. They're not inducing fear. In fact, they're in, uh, invoking hope, uh, which is something we're kind of not used to as journalists, right? Usually we're, we're the bearers of bad news. Uh, but in this case, this gives us an opportunity to, to provide some positive outlook, some hope, um, which as you know, you guys have been journalists now, uh, you've done some journalism. Once you get out there and you're reporting this stuff day to day, it takes its toll on you too. It gets really hard when you keep reporting doom and gloom to keep a positive attitude about the state of the world. Uh, and so these types of stories can be an antidote to that for you as well. So basically in this day and age, anyone with a phone can produce breaking news, right? You just have to be in the right place at the right time, point your phone and you have the top watched video and any news site anywhere in the world, just as an average citizen, right? Uh, there was a, a case when, when mobile phones were just kind of becoming uh, a, a big deal uh, where there was a, uh, a guy with a mobile phone who happened to catch a crane falling in a downtown area in Georgia on a car, and they sent it to the local newspaper. 
And this newspaper had invested millions on building a TV studio. They were trying to get like produce these top quality videos. That like shaky crane footage was their top viewed video of the year. So anyone, anyone with a phone could do could be in the right place at the right time. It's not our bread and butter anymore as news producers. The focus for these type of stories is on the whole story, not just the problem. We're going to add depth and context, right? So we're going to walk through those steps like we've talked about where we're examining the response, we're looking for evidence, we're talking about the limitations, we want the whole thing. If we're only reporting on the problem, then we're only telling part of the story. So this is argu arguably more investigative uh, journalism than most traditional journalism is that just kind of focuses on the who, what, when, where, not even so much the why. Uh, and it also fulfills our journalist's role as public service. How many of you guys are getting into this for the money? Yeah, said no one ever, said no journalist ever, right? No, you're getting into it for the most part because you want to make a difference. You want to make a difference in the world. You care about communities. Uh, maybe you have just a talent for it. Most of you do. Uh, but we do this because it's it matters to us. It's important. And this type of journalism can help us to fulfill that public service role that so many of us are called into this industry for. So what we're going to do, I'm going to play this story for you. It's about four minutes long. I'm going to play this story for you. And I want you to think about these questions as we go. So I'm going to ask you about this. At what point does this turn from a traditional issues-based story to a solutions journalism story? I want you to look for that pivot point. Uh, are, are reporters advocating for a particular solution? And what roles does solutions journalism prompt reporters to take on? So I want you to really think, because you guys are training to be journalists, those of you online might already be uh, journalists. So I want you to think about what your role in this type of thing would be and how it's maybe a little different from traditional reporting. So I'm going to go ahead and play this one. <clears throat> Eventually. There we go. Five dollar your way, I rule this day. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> just been raised. Hey, Whopper Jr. is something new. Following this ad. Junior. There we go. We looked at one doctor who's licensed in both Texas and North Carolina. On the Texas Medical Board's website, Oops, sorry, somehow it started up. We looked at one doctor who's licensed in both Texas and North Carolina. On the Texas Medical okay. Board's website, you'll find no record of. Sorry, this is just a clip of it. I'm not sure where the why is the whole thing not popping up. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Hey Jen, while you're futzing with that, could you turn yeah. up the volume on your um for the clips just a little bit? Yeah, can do. Let me see if there's a problem here. Here, I'll turn it up on my computer. That should be better. Okay. Texas officials, if they would consider that here, but we're told it would require actually That's changing right, Rebecca. state law. There are other resources you can use to look up your doctor. To find those yep. on hire still practicing series, go to the investigative section of KXAN.com. Okay, that was the end. <laughs> Sorry, we'll get this eventually. I swear, every time I try to show broadcast clips in, in my classes, it's always like, I always have issues. Okay, real this time. There we go. This week, KXAN revealed how some doctors disciplined in other states have come here to Texas, able to practice with clean records without patients knowing their histories. And we are committed to not only exposing these problems, but also exploring solutions. KXAN investigator Matt Grant shows you how one state is tackling this problem by giving the power back to patients. If you want to look up your doctor, what you find could be determined by where you live. So if you search their record here in Texas, it would show com a completely clear record? Correct. 
A three-month KXAN investigation found nearly 50 doctors able to practice in Texas with clean records, with no mention of disciplinary actions in other states, including having their licenses suspended, surrendered, and revoked, information doctors are required to report. And if these doctors are required to self-report, who's ensuring that they actually are? We're trying to provide transparency to patients in the public. While Texas promises transparency, we found it lacking compared to other states. We looked at one doctor who's licensed in both Texas and North Carolina. On the Texas Medical Board's website, you'll find no record of any out-of-state disciplinary actions or malpractice claims. Compare that to the North Carolina Medical Board, which reveals a 2018 public letter of concern, reciprocal letters of reprimand from four other states, and two medical malpractice settlements. The board found he misinterpreted a five centimeter mass. That's the size of a lime on an MRI as normal, when in fact it was cancer. North Carolina patients have direct access to all these records, while Texas patients are left in the dark. If we are aware of an action, then we post it on our website and it never goes away. Jean Fisher Brinkley is a spokesperson for the North Carolina Medical Board. She says North Carolina began posting disciplinary actions online 22 years ago. Transparency efforts continued even further in 2007 after a law was passed making hospital privilege actions and malpractice settlements, which are often settled in secret, public. Brinkley says there was fierce opposition to that. You know, it's a big emotional topic. You know, a lot of, of clinicians really feel strongly that um, sometimes those things are settled for business reasons and not because their care was was insufficient. Are you ready to become a more informed patient? The state ultimately sided with transparency, believing more information and easy access to records are the best way to serve patients. Another obstacle the state had to overcome, building a massive database and getting the public to use it. Brinkley acknowledges the way North Carolina operates is not necessarily the norm, but says it's a model other states should consider. Most of the time, there's nothing to find. But if there is something to find, wouldn't you rather know about it before? After we started asking questions, the TMB promised a fix, saying it will now post new out-of-state disciplinary actions online. But under a state law, a description of that information should already be public, something our investigation found is not routinely happening. As far as does the medical board go and review all you know, 154,000 of our licensees to make sure that they've disclosed everything that's come in, uh, that's something that's a little more time intensive that uh, the medical board has not uh, in the past done. We asked for examples of what's being done now and were sent a doctor whose public profile was updated to say, action taken in Michigan in 2019 with reciprocal discipline in three other states. No other details were mentioned. So what was that action? Texas doesn't say. Turns out that doctor, though, is also licensed in North Carolina. And by checking its website, only then could we see the doctor's full disciplinary history with links to official documents showing he was placed on probation and fined 5,000 bucks for multiple violations, including improperly dispensing medications without conducting an exam. What is the standard of transparency that Texans deserve. I asked the Texas Medical Board if it would consider adopting a model similar to North Carolina's as a way to increase transparency, but didn't hear back. The TMB never addressed why it isn't fully following the law, instead saying it has historically relied on doctors to self-report out-of-state disciplinary actions due to staffing and time. In Austin, Matt Grant, KXAN Investigates. In Texas, doctors must report. All right, so let's let's take a look at this. Um, at what point does the story transition to one about problems to one about a solution? Yeah. I guess um, for talking about like how Texas could win in North Carolina's um, rig system. Exactly, yeah. So the top of the story is all about the problems with Texas, the investigation, the lack of transparency. But then, hey, here's a, an a, a state comparable doing what we want to do correctly. And so that's a pretty common hallmark in solutions journalism is looking at what other places are doing to solve a problem that's similar to one that we have in our community. Are reporters at any point advocating for a particular solution here? No, right? There's at, not, at no point are they like banging on doors saying, why you guys should do this, right? But they are asking, why don't you? Uh, and that's a perfectly common function for a reporter, right? We are watchdogs of our community. If there's something that we're missing, 
if there's something that's missing in our community, but somebody else is doing it right, ask those questions. Why aren't we doing this this way? And so what role does that prompt solution or prompt reporters to take on? You know, you saw at the end uh, where the reporter basically did have to take on that watchdog role saying, we did the homework here. We've looked at this solution. Why aren't you guys doing this? And what was the response? No comment, right? And we all know that no comment is the loudest comment you could make. Uh, and it's very suspicious, right? We're all kind of looking at Texas now going, Texas, come on, guys, get it together, right? Not that Texas has a completely clean record of, you know, doing things the right way, but, you know, it's, it's, it puts the reporter in a position of kind of investigator and community, I wouldn't say advocate, but community leader, for sure. And that's something that news uh, reporters really should be. A news organization, when it's embedded in a community, should take that role of being a community leader seriously. And so this type of reporting really does do that. So this is the breakdown of what all, all the elements in a solutions journalism story. And for your final project, we're basically gonna be doing these type of things. We're gonna be looking at a solution uh, and we're going to be trying to kind of identify all these parts. We're going to do it using an alternative story format known as zines, but we'll talk more about that. Bless you. We'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. So basically, the first thing uh, that a, a solutions journalism story is going to do typically is identify the problem, right? We can't just launch into a solution without knowing what problem we're trying to solve. But again, that part is going to be minimal. That's why I have it separated out and thinner, because that's not the focus of the story. That's just kind of the, hey, there's this problem. Okay, but that's not what the story is about. The story is about the response. And again, this is basically gonna be our nut graft here, right? What is the response? We're gonna describe it. How is it done? How does it work? That type of thing. And we're gonna be as descriptive as possible here. Insight is basically the, the narrative of the story. It's the background. Uh, has it been done before? Can it be replicated? What's the context? How did this come to be? So kind of your basic feature storytelling elements there, you know, just kind of the background, a little bit of extra info. Evidence is going to be what evidence is there that suggests that this solution is effective. Now, we're not looking for, again, remember, uh, good intentions or good ideas. We're looking for solutions in progress, things that are proven to work. And so we're, we're looking for two different kinds of evidence here. You guys probably have heard of these in your research-based classes, qualitative and quantitative evidence, right? Does anyone know the difference with qualitative or quantitative? Yep, so numbers is quantitative, so like a 59% increase in this thing, right? What about qualitative? I guess like just adjectives, like if you can tell the water is clear, uh, water preservation program. Yeah. Yeah. So more like anecdotes, right? So like this worked for me. And, and so interviewing sources and having sources tell you, yeah, this is working for me, that kind of thing. So we're looking for both of those kinds of evidence. In some cases, only one of those exists, but for the most part, it's not too hard to find both. And then of course, like I said, it would not be journalism if we didn't explore the limitations too. Is there anybody this is not serving or not working for? What are the barriers to entry? What's, what is preventing us from possibly doing this, right? Uh, and you saw at the very end of that story, I mean, there were a lot of limitations. Uh, the primary limitation being that the Texas board was not responsive uh, to this investigation. But then he also mentioned issues of time and staffing. Uh, and those are real barriers that tend to plague a lot of solutions, right? We, we don't necessarily have all the people that we need to make a solution happen. So we have to explore all of those things. All right. So in that story in particular, we, I'm going to kind of pull out the different uh, elements of it. First of all, we have the problem, the lack of transparency regarding doctors and Texas. Then we've got our response, which is looking at North Carolina's system of publishing records, which was, uh, you know, is working for them. Our insight, uh, the site began posting disciplinary actions in 2000 and passed laws increasing transparency in 2007. There's a lot of background there that they talk about how this all came to be uh, and how it's working, that type of thing. Then we've got our evidence. Uh, uh, North Carolina's medical board is ranked most transparent in the country. That's pretty good evidence right there uh, that this is working. 
And then their limitations, time, cost, lack of response from Texas officials, things like that. So you can see all these elements at play in the story. And that's what the hallmark of a good solution story. So it's not just going out and being like, okay, um, this group of, of you know, Girl Scouts is uh, raising money uh, to donate to their uh, local food drive. Okay, cute, fine. But that's gonna be a pretty quick story, right? We need to look at kind of deeper issues that are going on. That's not to say that kids, I keep using kids as an example, um, but that's not to say that kids can't be solution starters. In fact, in a lot of them, they are, uh, because kids have energy and they want to see change. They don't understand why change is hard because bureaucracy hasn't beaten them down yet. So go kids, right? Uh, one of my favorite stories, and unfortunately, I used to use it in this uh, in this talk, but I couldn't find it anymore because broadcast uh, pulls their stories offline a lot. Uh, there was a story about a group of track and field athletes that were running uh, as part of their tra practice uh, in a particular city. I think it was maybe Detroit. Um, and uh, they then went to city council and lobbied for solar school buses so that they weren't like continuously breathing in fumes during their runs. And it was a lot of money, uh, but they got it done. Uh, and that was pretty impressive. So that story looked at kind of all of those different aspects with obviously money being the major limitation there. So now it's your turn. We're going to look at these uh, at these elements. And what I want you to do is think about identifying. So in your notes or online folks, if you want to follow along, what I'd like you to do is tell me what the problem is, what's the response, what's the, some of the background, the insight, where's the evidence, and what are the limitations? So I want you to look for all these. This is a much shorter story. So I want you to look for all of these elements throughout, and then we're going to talk about them. This one I may have to find because it's part of a larger YouTube broadcast. And this one actually comes from um, Grady News Source, which is the student uh, SU version of SUTV uh, for the University of Georgia. So you if you want, you might want to jot down your, so you don't the forget. This is important. I'm right, also... gonna find the story in the newscast. Our Madison Cook shows us how Wheels of Hope provides rise Oops, not that one. you can't drive. Bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy kiss. This is it. Okay, okay, here we go. Al Jacobson tells us how they found one solution to two problems. At the UGA Garden, student workers work with Trader Joe's to collect viable produce that they were getting rid of every Sunday, along with produce being grown firsthand at the garden. Imperfect produce is one of the highest contributors to food waste. We're very scared of consuming something that has a little mix. Hey, Jen, can you turn that up a little bit? It's hard to hear. Sorry, our volume is all the way up, Rebecca, so I'm not sure how to get it uh, more online for you guys. I I'm sharing my sound, so I'm not sure why that's not working. Hmm. All right, well, no matter, we'll, we'll muddle through. Thanks. Our volume is all the way up. Rebecca, can you hear me? Yeah, I just had gone back on mute. Thank you for trying. Rebecca? Um, hang on, maybe it's, maybe it's. <laughs> hang on guys, sorry. No, I feel like. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Um, actually, I I can hear you, so oh, okay. it's just a little low. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to. Oh, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. Um, uh, can you hear us now? I can. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. We've got. I've got it up full full blast here. So I'll start it again. Okay. A nonprofit at the University of Georgia is trying to make a change. Grady News Source reporter Al Jacobson tells us how they found one solution to two problems. At the UGA Garden, student workers work with Trader Joe's to collect viable produce that they were getting rid of every Sunday, along with produce being grown firsthand at the garden. Imperfect produce is one of the highest contributors to food waste. We're very scared of consuming something that has a little nick or a rip, we just throw it away. You know, more often than usual, this is a perfectly safe. Student volunteers sort the food pickup each Sunday, where they compost what has gone bad, keep the usable imperfect produce, weigh what's left, and take inventory for that week's meals. We're sending it to people who 
a lot of our families are not homeless, but um, are taking care of grandkids. They're older. They can't really access food like they, they need to. After sorting, shift leaders come in to plan what meals they can make for the week based off of what they have. And then the Monday cooking, we did bell peppers, tomatoes. Um, they have some onions and some different herbs that we had, some basil and thyme fresh. Um, and we gave them those, so they'll be making a kind of beef. Uh, there's some ground beef with it, so they'll make a ground beef vegetable stew kind of thing with lentils. Um, so it adds some extra protein to the since we didn't have that much beef this week. After this, meals are bundled by ingredient, weighed, and put in the refrigeration. Then, there are weekly cooking shifts, followed by volunteers on delivery routes. A lot of the client delivery is also getting to interact with those people, getting to talk to them, getting to have them have some social interaction and happiness that you can share with them. Mary Kokenauer drives some of these delivery routes, even becoming a household name to one family, whose name is hidden for privacy reasons, where even the grandkids recognize her when they're in town to visit. Campus Kitchen has recovered over 330,000 pounds of food, delivering over 700 meals per month. However, there is still much to be done about food waste that everyday consumers can contribute to. To, to be more responsible when we're buying products, you know, not to buy because it's cheap, but to buy because we need it. Until more people avoid wasting food, organizations like Campus Kitchen will continue recovering leftover food, helping those in need. Ella Jacobson for Grady News Source. After the break, we learn about an... All right, so let's take a look at that story. So what's the problem? Yeah. Um, just imperfect groceries are causing all this waste. Yeah, food waste in general, right? How much time of that roughly two and a half minute story did they talk about the problem? Like, real quick, yeah, like four seconds at the beginning, right? Like food waste. Okay, let's talk about the response, right? So what's the response? To go through all of the food that they're saving or growing and put the food that's like expired or gross like they compost that but then all the yeah yeah so they basically created kind of like a meals on wheels type of program using this this free food that's discarded for reasons that just they don't it doesn't look good but it's it's perfectly fine right so some insight that's always the hardest thing to identify um god it's so loud. So, uh, I'm going to turn that volume down. We seem to be having all kinds of audio issues today. Um, so with our insight, uh, we could basically, it talks about kind of how the program got started, um, what they do, you know, going out with the buses and that kind of thing and delivering the meals. So that's kind of our insight there. What about evidence? What kind of evidence did they provide that this is working? They had um, the numbers of how much like pounds of food they're giving and how many meals they're giving out. Yep, yep. So they provided that quantitative evidence of the numbers of, um, of uh, pounds of food that they've been able to salvage and the number of meals that they've been able to deliver. They also give a quick uh, qualitative anecdote too with uh, the girl who's delivering uh, the foods and how the family knows her and things like that. So kind of showing that this creates a community connection as well. And what about limitations? What's the limitation here? Consumers like in the grocery stores are still wasting food on this. Yeah, basically, this is like, look, we acknowledge that we're not going to save the world here, right? This is just a one one possible solution. Here's somebody doing something, and that that's a pretty common limitation as well. You know, we're not going to solve um, food waste issues in this country uh, with one small gesture. But with more people seeing things like this, more of these gestures could be made. And then we start to move toward a possible solution. I know when I saw this story, I was like, man, if we had something like that here, I would totally want to get involved with that. It seems really cool. Um, so this is a great example of kind of all of those elements pretty quickly, you know, two and a half minute story. It's not terribly long or drawn out like the Texas one is a little bit deeper, goes a little bit deeper. Um, but this one really does hit all those elements that we needed it to. Uh, pretty succinctly. Oh, I lost my pointer. Hang on. There we go. All right. So let's talk about some common myths with pollutions journalism. I will tell you, so I've done, um, my experience with this is I've been in two cohorts, two fellowships uh, to train in teaching solutions journalism. So I've gotten to go out to kind of journal solutions journalism central in Oregon, in Portland, uh, where they actually have a solutions journalism uh, training facility. 
Uh, and so I've gotten to go out there and in, in becoming a solutions journalism ambassador, I've encountered all kinds of suspicion about this type of journalism, all kinds of things, myths that people think are true about it uh, and that kind of prevent them from wanting to do it. So I want to kind of lay some of those to rest. So the first one, uh, solutions journalism is biased. It asks journalists to suggest or advocate for solutions or problems. In fact, that's actually not true at all. Real uh, solution stories are balanced. They should provide balanced coverage. Now, there's not going to be as many elements of conflict in these stories as maybe a traditional breaking news story about politics or something along the lines, but we are still going to provide balance. These stories should not be promotional. That's not the goal here. Um, so journalists should never advocate for a particular solution. Yes, we might uh, uh, bring it to light and no, we can't uh, objectively remove our brain and say, oh, we feel nothing about this. Obviously, you might think this is a good solution, but it's not your job to insert your voice and say, we should all be doing this, right? Uh, solutions journalism is basically enterprise reporting. You guys remember what enterprise reporting is? It's a story that kind of just, I'll refresh your memories. <laughs> I'm sure you know, but I'll refresh your memories. So enterprise reporting is basically issues-based or trend-based stories that aren't born out of like a breaking news event or a press release or some kind of a planned meeting, something like that. These are gonna look kind of more holistically at something happening as opposed to reacting to a news event, more proactive than reactive. And it connects the dots for people who are impacted by an issue. So say for instance, we are uh, we do have a problem with food, uh, food waste. And we're like, man, I, I, I know I do. I hate wasting food. I hate when I'm like, at, and I'm so bad about eating leftovers too. So it's like, I have like kind of these two uh, incongruent thoughts in my head at all times. I'm like, oh, leftovers, but also uh, food waste. Uh, and so something like this could appeal to someone like me who maybe doesn't know what I could do to be better, to do something that would help. Um, so this basically just points people in the right direction. Remember that uh, in journalism, agenda setting theory means that we don't necessarily tell people what to think, but we tell them what to think about. So we're providing them with some basically food for thought, right? Things that we can kind of mull around in our heads that, that we could maybe be a part of if we want to. Nobody's pushing you to, but if you want to, here's this thing. Second, it's either solutions journalism or more traditional watchdog reporting. You can't have both. So a lot of people, uh, a lot of the kind of suspicious things I've heard about this say, you know, oh, it's fluff, it's lighthearted reporting, it's, it's, you know, features, which can't be serious journalism, right? I'm saying this to a class called Advanced Feature Storytelling right now. So yeah, basically with this, we're not talking about stuff uh, that's, that's all light and fluffy and happy. This is actual rigorous and thorough reporting. In fact, if you're reporting a solution story, your interviews and your investigative pieces of your story are going to take longer because you have to hit all of those elements, right? We have to detail the response. We have to provide insights, background, context. We have to find evidence of that solution working and we have to hit those limitations. That's more thorough reporting than most reporters do on any given story. And so this type of stuff, it is in depth. It's not light, it's not fluffy. Uh, it hinges on evidence and it holds those in power accountable. You saw in the, in the medical uh, transparency story, how basically they took this solution to the people in charge and went, hey, why, why isn't something like this doable here? Why aren't we doing something like this? And those leaders had to, or chose not to, account for their actions, right? So this is watchdog reporting at its finest. The second, uh, what you're reporting on has to be the solution, right? Like you can only report on it as solutions journalism if it does solve every problem if it's the main uh, you know, key that unlocks everything. So remember that solutions journalism does not encourage a one-size-all philosophy, one-size-fits-all uh, type of thing. We know that to solve problems like climate change, to solve problems like the opioid epidemic, that it's gonna take a lot of little things. It's not just gonna be, oh, well, here's a pill for that, done. It doesn't really work that way. And so solutions journalism has to acknowledge that we can't, this one solution doesn't save the world. That's where limitations uh, come in. Limitations point to areas in need of improvement and or problems with local implementation. So there may be very valid reasons why what's happening in North Carolina can't be applied in Texas. 
the leaders didn't account for it. They didn't respond with their no comment. Um, so we don't know what those problems might be. But we do have to acknowledge that it doesn't necessarily work everywhere in the exact same way. This is just what's working here and now. And solutions journalism, like I said, is a process. It's continuous. It might be working now, but future reporting might reveal flaws. And remember, we are not parachute journalists. You know, hopping into uh, crisis situations like, you know, the Weather Channel in my sister's backyard in Florida right now. Uh, what we, we are, when we are community journalists, we are staying, we're embedding, we are part of this problem and part of the solution. And so we need to be regularly reporting on the issue and coming back again and again and again, not just, okay, one and done. I did that story, I'm moving on. So a little bit about kind of journalist attitudes for this. This is a study that was done actually by a, a few of the people who are really heavily involved in solutions journalism implementation. And you can see, uh, according to this study, uh, they asked journalists what they felt their roles were uh, in the, at a news organization, what they felt their biggest roles were. And so you can see here, their number one role uh, was accurately portray the world. 70% of journalists who were surveyed said, That's, that is one of my key roles. As, as a journalist. Uh, investigate government claims, also really a high. Provide analysis of complex problems. These are all pretty traditional uh, problem-oriented type of things in a lot of ways. But you can see here, they also threw in some stuff that was geared more toward a solutions journalism kind of bit. Um, contribute to society's well-being. About 50% of journalists said that that should be the job of a journalist. Uh, alert the public of potential opportunities. About 40% felt like that was part of their role. Uh, then getting even lower here, point to possible solutions. Only 22% of journalists said they felt like they should be doing that. Uh, and motivate ordinary people to get involved, about 25% said, yeah, that we, we should as journalists be doing that. And so journalists have long been reluctant to do this kind of thing because ethically we're scared to become advocates. And I'll tell you that's been the biggest barrier for people to accepting systems journalism as a mode of reporting. Yeah. I love serve as an adversary of business at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Serve as an adversary of big, big business. They mean not like, you know, screw the local uh, yeah, yeah. small businesses, but yeah. I the word <laughs> adversary. Yeah, and there's one adversary for, of government too, right here. Yeah. So luckily we don't see ourselves as doing that too often, setting the political agenda, that kind of thing. But yeah, so, so at, because solutions journalism has kind of those, those, the potential to sound fluffy, to sound like advocacy, to sound like it's not real hardcore journalism. But in fact, like I said, it kind of is at the highest levels. We're doing more in-depth work here. Um, acceptance is slow, as many people, like I said, are tied to those more traditional roles. We see our jobs as like dashing out the door to go cover this breaking news issue. But again, any idiot with a cell phone can do that, right? Anyone can and probably better because they're already there. And so this type of journalism is the work we need to move toward. What can we do as journalists that people with a cell phone and a social media account can't? We can provide context. We can put the pieces together. We can connect the dots for our audiences. And this type of journalism allows us to do that. And like I said, with the rise of social media interaction between journalists and their audience, this type of community connection, the role of a journalist in his or her community is more important than ever. Because if we're not showing that we're members of our communities, what good are we? Why would anyone come to us, right? Are you guys good here? Okay. All right, so a couple things to wrap up. Why do we need solutions journalism? I kind of started to talk about this. Well, first, solutions journalism illustrates what's possible. We talked about news fatigue. I know you guys, we've talked about this before. How many of you guys at some point in recent years have just been like, I just can't with the news anymore? I know I have, right? It, it's, it gets exhausting. So this shows us what's possible instead of all the things, all the things that are just piling on our shoulders as a society. It stimulates conversation, inspiring without advocating. So there's a difference. It's a fine line that you have to walk. And it's something probably as you're working on your solutions pieces, I'll have to kind of push you uh, away from the line a little bit because you're probably going to find a solution that you believe in. Um, so online folks, you guys already know, we're going to be doing a Habitat for Humanity build right after the Thanksgiving break. 
it's a great program. I'll go ahead and say, it's really cool. Those things that they do, they work. There are limitations though. And we're going to have to find out about those limitations. We can't just say, look how great Habitat is. We have to actually really look at it full throttle. What's the evidence that it's working? Um, what's the, the where, where does their helpfulness stop? You know, what else needs to be done to solve the bigger problem of homelessness or home insecurity here in this area? It brings the conversation home. So again, we're talking about local journalism. We're not talking about federal agents at the highest level or members of Congress trying to solve huge worldwide problems. We're talking about your family, your friends, your uh, community groups. What, so what solutions are they actually working toward? And I told you guys before on election day, election day, uh, Tuesday, that those local elections, they're the ones that matter. Those are the ones that decide the things that are actually going on around you. What's happening at the higher levels of Congress, with few exceptions, don't impact our lives nearly as much as what's going on at the state and local levels. And so journalism should have a similar approach, right? Who cares if Congress passes some big, uh, you know, climate change bill? Well, you know, if we're not seeing the impact at a local level, okay, great, yay, Congress, you know? But here we can actually see people getting stuff done and we can get involved We can uh, with the things that we care about. And like I said, that leads me to that point, empowers our residents to change on their own. So again, you see a story like the food, uh, the food waste one, and you think like, oh man, I hate food waste. What can I do? Oh, I can do this if I want to. If I don't really care about it, I don't have to. Nobody's making me. But that type of thing is compelling for people who want to do something but really don't know how to start. And I think that that speaks for most of us, right? There's a lot of things I care about that I'm like, oh, does anyone do that here? And I also don't have the time to go looking for it. I would really just rather somebody even tell me about it. Okay, and that's what journalists can do. We're here to help. Remember that helpfulness is one of our news values as well. All right, who cares? Why do we care, right? Well, remember that uh, trust in news organizations is at an all-time low. Uh, it's historically low around election time, but you can see uh, your newspapers represent the yellow line. Their television news is the uh, darker green line. There are these ones that are hanging out down here. Uh, public schools are slightly above us. Church and, and religion is above us. And Congress, well, they're down here at the bottom with us, right? So people are losing faith in institutions in this country. The news, the media, we are an institution. And so this type of stuff, if we are trying to do this type of work, trying to energize and be a positive force in our communities for our audiences, this trust is gonna go up. And we need that, we want that, because basically our bread and butter, how our, we make our money is through loyalty, through trust. If people trust us as a news source, they're not gonna let anything bad happen to us, ideally. So this enables journalists to really demonstrate their commitment to the community, like I said, really kind of puts us in a different kind of role in our community. I'll tell you my first job uh, at, out, of, um, out of college as a full-time reporter uh, was in a smaller community in Florida and it was at a twice a week paper. And I knew everyone in that community, they knew me. And because of the work I was doing, I was digging in, I was out there all the time. People trusted me and our tiny little paper was very successful for our small audience. Uh, everybody in town read that paper. They knew who I was. They knew I was gonna be there and they knew I was gonna tell the story fairly. This gives us an opportunity to go back to that kind of reporting that we've gotten away from because newsrooms are getting slashed, right? We're losing reporters, we're bleeding reporters in newsrooms. And so this kind of thing helps us to get back to that reporting uh, when we really could be members of the community. It steers us away, like I said, for ex exploitation of bad news. We do, as journalists, tend to sensationalize bad news when it happens because, frankly, those get clicks. Bad news gets a lot of clicks. But we tend to exploit those issues in ways that lower that community trust. And this helps push us away from that, helps us to create better habits as, as news producers. And like I said, we're, it helps us to be more productive than destructive. And this basically is the bottom line here, why people don't trust us. 
When we sensationalize bad news, when we're looking uh, to exploit people at their lowest moments, that makes us look pretty crappy, right? And so if we are actually being productive members of community rather than looking to profit off of people's lowest moments, then we're going to ultimately restore faith in our institution. So again, this is watchdog journalism at its finest, uh, the type of work that we should be doing. It's our job. We're called the fourth estate. Does anyone know what the first three are? What the first three estates in the United States are? Delaware is number one, right? No, no, not states, estates. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so the, so media, the media is the fourth estate. The first, second, and third are the legislative, executive, and uh, judicial branches of government. So our job as the fourth estate is to watch over the first three and make sure they're doing their job. And as a little bonus question, uh, years ago when blogging was a thing, they were known as the fifth estate because they were watching us. So yeah, fun stuff. So we're the fourth estate. It helps us to do our job, to fulfill that role as watchdogs. It asks those in power, where are your solutions? Are you just going to be, you know, is it always going to be an election season, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, where you're focusing on problems, where you're fear mongering, where you're, you're prompting anger, or are you going to do something? That's our job as journalists. It's not our job to create these solutions, but it's our job to ask questions. Why aren't you? Why aren't you solving these problems that you're scaring everybody about? And it empowers citizens to call on leaders for answers, not just us, but if we bring it to the public attention, hey, Texas uh, legislators are not interested in following their own laws as regarding transparency, I guarantee you people started complaining there. This is a little bit of an older story. I haven't seen the follow-up to it, but it's Texas, so probably not much changed. But at least they probably were motivating people toward action in this way. So journalism, as we know, is flailing in the digital age where we're suffering, we're bleeding people because so many people are putting up fake news, they're putting up content that's free and journalists aren't getting paid for their work. Um, there's so many conflicting reports, there's so much competition that pushes us to just repeat the news over and over and over again. And so we have news fatigue, like I said, it's common. Most of the time, uh, uh, people experience uh, news fatigue. It's a pretty common syndrome. Uh, and so we need, we need you. We need this kind of reporting. It actually, it's been demonstrated that this type of reporting does increase revenue. Subscriptions go up, cable fees, donations uh, go up when reporters take on this type of approach. There is actual tangible value for a news organization in doing this kind of thing. Advertise, sorry, these are just advertising revenues and things like that. So basically, why do this? The bottom line is it's our job. This is what we're signing up for. We're not signing up for sitting in council meetings for five hours and just regurgitating facts. We're not signing up for um, heading out to the farm and doing a story on crispy bacon. And those are fun and it's nice. But what we really signed up for was to be a force for change in our community, to be a voice for our people in our audience who don't, who are voiceless. It also helps, I will tell you, with representation uh, in these stories. Too often in problems-based stories, we let politicians and officials uh, be the voice, be the primary voices in a story. But when we do solutions journalism, we're turning to people who are at the citizen level and that those voices tend to be a lot more diverse and a lot more uh, impacted and impactful in our stories. So but the bottom line is we should do this because it's our job. And that's pretty much all there is to it. All right. I have a couple more notes for you guys, but online folks, I am done uh, with the solutions journalism portion of things. Um, so if anybody does have any questions or anything, I'm happy to take that. But I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen off for you guys.